Homelessness was endemic in Victorian Britain, but sleeping out on the streets wasn't limited to adults. In the 19th century, children could also commonly be found wandering alone or in gangs for safety, equal victims to poverty, having been sent out to work at an age little more than babies to support their parents, either to buy food or alcohol. But they also found their way onto the streets from broken homes or abusive parents. Indeed, some were orphans, though many had homes, but that life was so bad that the cold and lonely streets seemed preferable. However they found their way onto the streets, either by running away from trouble at home or having been sent out to work or beg, they were forced to grow up quickly, become streetwise, and learn to survive in a mean and dangerous world. It was as much a symptom of poverty in Britain and North America's towns and cities then as it is today in urban areas of Africa, Asia, and South America. With industrialization and the explosion of population in expanding towns and cities, there was, despite a high mortality rate, a huge number of children, for there was no readily available contraception, and, in any event, families were large as children were necessary to contribute to the income of working-class families to afford food and lodging. There was little support at this time for the poor beyond your own family and friends, and so Victorian-era society became dominated by children, a laissez-faire society of which its politicians were largely indifferent to the consequences of child labor and their welfare since it contributed to the economy. Consequently, for much of the century, there was no compulsory schooling, the absence of which did much to keep children on the streets. The Victorians called street children various derogatory names, street Arabs, street urchins, gutter snipes, and waifs. The epithet, Arab, is said to have been first used by the philanthropist Lord Shaftesbury in the 1850s because, according to a writer of the time, they roamed the desert, like children did the same on the streets, without restraints of social and civil life, trusting no one, living in clans for protection, and their preeminent object in life being subsistence, food, shelter, and clothing. The use of the word Arab was objected to by many in the 19th century, since it sounded rough, uncharitable, offensive, and degrading, particularly to those who aimed to reclaim these neglected children. Yet it endured, and can be found in many writings and illustrations of the time. When listening to the account you are about to hear, please bear in mind that the language and descriptions of these children may also, at times, sound coarse and uncaring, but it was a style that belonged to that era. Today, you will hear a contemporary account of street children by a late 19th century author concerned with child neglect. He wrote in order to bring attention to the destitution they faced, describing various types, as he sees them, of street children and giving a narrative of conversations with some of them, one story telling why a girl found herself alone on the streets, and another tale describing what happened to a boy found cold and alone by a lady outside her home. Before we move on, please consider clicking the subscribe button for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. Please check out the description to see how you can support the channel and the content we make. The nomadic child tribes of the cities have their own dialect, customs and traditions of all sizes, all degrees of mental caliber and all varieties of physical constitution. There is immense diversity among them, though as a class having much in common, they may not be pronounced a unit. Their conduct fills one with indignation or with pity or with alternations of both. Though studiously ignorant of every proper mode of government, yet they have their own code of honor and their own notions of justice. They fear no one so much as the policeman. Him they regard as an unmitigated nuisance, the chief hindrance to their success in life. When it was asked of one, when your father and mother forsake you, who will take you up? The ready reply was, the police, sir. Yet on promising as the soil is for a fruitful harvest, these Arabs are capable of reclamation, and through patience and kindness are frequently transformed into worthy citizens. 
Gutter Snipes is the title which designates that class of children who are too utterly weak, both mentally and physically, to cope with a more sturdy Arab. Like Snipes, a bird that feeds with a long beak, they are creatures of suction. A garbage heap is frequently their source of supply to furnish them with the ever-coveted, always-needed victuals to meet the craving of gaunt hunger. I ain't got the gripes yet was the half-joyous, strange reply of a feeble little creature when asked if she were hungry. They comes the third day, was the additional information when interrogated. For two days this poor child had been elbowed from the barrels where scraps were to be found, and all the while had not tasted food. But with some measure of joy she thought of the terrible day as not quite upon her, when the unsparing gripes would tear her like a wild beast. Waif is more comprehensive, a term embracing many grades of young unfortunates. The term in English law means goods found of which the owner is not known. They were originally such goods as a thief, when pursued, threw away to prevent being apprehended. A waif, then, being something ownerless and unclaimed. The term has easily become applicable to describe those children deserted by their parents as also those, possibly less fortunate, who are not deserted, but held of their own unnatural parents or guardians in subjugation more relentless and calamitous than desertion. To denounce their unnatural parents will not save the child. Of what utility it is to anathemize the drunken father who refused to pay the fine for his lad found guilty of hauling driftwood from the river and allowed him to be incarcerated with hardened criminals, unless we can throw some arm of protection around the child, not literally orphaned, but morally outcast? Will he be less vicious after his coarse contact with vile ruffians, paying the due penalty for their own misdeeds in the common jail? Though he be neither Arab nor gutter snipe, he needs friendly help and timely protection. But employ whatever terms we please to designate these children, the fact remains the same. There are thousands of outcast boys and girls. We have not far to travel in order to discover the real objects of our charity. I do not, however, encourage an impulse of random visitation. Arabs and gutter snipes are at our doors. Literally, they are near at hand. A gentleman addressing a meeting, where opulence and luxury reigned supreme, narrated a discovery made by himself. I remember entering recently into one of the houses, not half a mile from where I am standing at this moment, and I caught a little black-haired, black-eyed girl. I believe she would have been very pretty if I could have seen through the dirt. She was running about, and I hailed her. I began to talk to her. In the first instance there was a slight sign of civil war, but when she became thoroughly aware of the fact that I was not a policeman, and that I did not mean any injury to her, and that I had kindly feelings for her, she became amenable, and the conversation took something like this form. "'Well, Lassie, where do you live?' She flung back her tangled hair, and looked me up right in the face, and said, "'Oh, about—' and she pointed round to the somewhat offensive court in which I was standing. I said, "'Where did you sleep last night, eh, Lassie?' "'Oh, there, on that stair.' And she pointed to a door. Not a door, but a doorway, for the door had disappeared. There was no sign of it and there were rickety stairs going up into the first floor. I said, Do you mean on the stair just there? She said, Yes. I said, Well, but where does your father live? Oh, father, she said, I haven't got one. But, I said, Is your father dead? No, she said, I never had one. I did not pursue that any further, but then I tried with regard to her mother. I said, well, but where is your mother? She said, Oh, she's gone. Gone? Gone where? Oh, for a watch. I rather blame myself. I think it was a little bit stupid, but I said, Gone for a watch? W -w what do you mean? Without a moment's hesitation, she showed me that she had gone for a watch, in the sense of having been sent to prison for stealing one. Then I said, Does nobody take care of you? How do you feed? Who gives you food, my child? She said. Oh, anybody. Sometimes I looked at the child. I doubted in my own mind whether it was better or worse for her for her mother to come back. 
bad as it seems to you and me, who have had noble and godly parents, and who ourselves are perhaps trying, humbly but faithfully in the fear of God, to do our duty by our children who are following. It seems a horrible thing to say, yet it is very likely, almost too true, that the position of those that are orphans is better than the position of those who have got such parents, as many of those children have. Is there anything in this world brighter and handsomer than a bright-faced boy? Nothing, I believe, at all, except perhaps a bright-faced girl. Is there anything more beautiful than to see such a child as that dragged out of the gutter, to see the frown which hardship has planted upon the face, so young, so unnaturally young, by degrees smooth away, to see the suspicion gradually plucked out of the eyes, to see the smile become gradually natural to the face, and to see how, in the course of weeks, or a few months at the outside, there has been an entire translation in that child from what it was, downcast, downtrodden, despised, and dangerous, into a being of beauty and a joy forever? The thousands of vendors, newspaper boys, street sweepers, and what not, if within age, are individually known, but beyond these we have a crowd of half-famished, half-naked children, who prowl about alleys and railway arches, fruit markets and the river foreshore, and the difficulty of pressing them into school is almost insuperable. They are no man's children, and live on no man's land. They deny their age, give false addresses, and pass over the boundary so as to elude the vigilance of the school board officers. Do not be shocked to hear that children of want, of sin, and woe are, alas, too numerous. They are found everywhere, the earnest labourer will soon find out their haunts, and will succeed in alluring them to a better condition and a higher life. Oh, do not gather your skirts or repel from your touch one of these little ones. If they cross your pathway, accept it as a task to be kindly undertaken, their reclamation, or at least their release, from the burden of poverty or ignorance. You will not fail to be interested in the following pathetic story of Poor Tom, and his strange career. Oh, but it was cold, freezing, biting bitter cold, and dark too, for the feeble gaslights, leaping and flaming as the gale whistled by, hardly brightened the gloom a dozen paces around them. The wind tore through the streets as if it had gone mad, whirling before it dust and snow, and every movable thing it could lay its clutching hand upon. A poor old battered kite, that, some time last autumn, had lodged far up in the tallest tree in the neighbourhood, and had there rested peacefully ever since, believing its labours at an end, was snatched, dragged from its nest, and driven on pittingly before the blast. Some feeble efforts it had made to dodge into corners, lurking behind steps and diving into areas, but not a bit of it. Down would swoop the wind, and off it would go again. At last, driven round one of a long row of barrels that stood like wretched sentinels along the pavement edge, it flew into the very arms of a small boy, who, seated on the curbstone, crouched down in a barrel's somewhat questionable shelter. Such a very small boy! He looked like nothing in the world but a little heap of rags. And the rags were very thin, and the small boy was very cold. His nose, his ears, his hands, and his poor bare feet were blue. He was almost too cold to shiver, certainly too cold to notice the unfortunate kite, which, as its enemy the wind approached with a roar, seemed to cower close to him, as if begging his protection. Round both sides of the barrel at once came the wind, shook hands right through poor little Tom, and, howling with the light, rushed off with its miserable victim. Tom, that was all the name he had. Who he was, or where he came from, no one knew, except, perhaps, the wretched old woman with whom he lived, which meant that she let him sleep upon a pile of rags on the floor of her miserable room, and sometimes gave him a crust, and oftener a blow. When she was drunk, and that was the greater part of the time, Tom took to the streets, and to-night she was very drunk. The boy was perhaps some six years old, 
but as he cowered down on the cold flagstones, with his worn, pinched face and drooping head, he might have been sixty. A carriage came rattling through the icy street and stopped close by him. The door was pushed open, and two children half tumbled out, and, leaving the door swinging, rushed up the steps. Tom watched them stupidly, heard the quick, sharp ring of the bell, caught a glimpse of something that looked very bright and warm, and then it was dark again. He turned his eyes towards the carriage, expecting it to drive off again, but it still stood there. The coachman sat upon the box like a furry monument. One of the horses struck the stones sharply with his iron hooves, and cast an inquiring glance round, but the monument sat unmoved. Tom's heavy eyes looked through the open door into the carriage. Dark as it was, he could see that it was lined with something thick and warm. He raised his head and glanced about him. If he were inside there, the wind could not touch him. Oh, if he only could get away from it one minute! He would slip out again the moment the house door opened. On bending his stiff little body, he crept nearer, hesitated a moment, and, as the wind came round the corner with a roar, slipped swiftly and noiselessly into the carriage. In the further corner of the seat he curled himself into a little round heap, and lay, with beating heart, listening to the wind as it swept by. It was very quiet in his nest, and the soft velvet was much warmer than the cold flagstones, and he was very tired and very cold, and in half a minute he was sound asleep. He did not know when at last the house door opened, and a lady, gathering her cloak closely around her, came down the steps, did not know even when the suddenly animated monument descended from its pedestal and stood solemnly by the open door until the lady had stepped inside, but when it shut with a slam, and the coachman, returning to the box, drove rapidly away, the boy's eyes opened and fixed their frightened gaze upon the lady's face. Preoccupied with her own thoughts, she had not noticed the strange bundle in the dark corner, but now, her attention attracted by some slight movement on his part, she turned her eyes slowly towards him, and then, with a suppressed cry of surprise and alarm, laid her hand upon the door. The rattle of the wheels and the roar of the wind prevented its reaching the ears of the coachman, and Tom, rapidly unwinding himself and cowering down in the bottom of the carriage, said with a frightened sob, I didn't mean no harm. I, I, I was awful cold. Please just open the door and, and I'll jump out. The lady, with her hand still on the door, demanded, How did you get here? The door was open and I come in, he answered. It was awful cold. The lady took her hand from the door. Come nearer, she said. Let me see your face. Tom drew his ragged sleeve across his eyes and glanced up at her with a scared look over his shoulder. They had turned into a brilliantly lighted street, and she could see that the tangled yellow hair was soft and fine, and that the big, frightened eyes that raised themselves to hers were not pickpocket's eyes. With a sudden impulse, she laid her gloved hand lightly on the yellow head. "'Where do you live?' she asked. Something in the voice and touch gave him courage. "'With Sal,' he answered, straightening up. "'Me and some other fellows. Sometimes we begs, sometimes we earns. When we get our all, it ain't so bad, but when we don't, we catch it. She's drunk tonight, and she drove us out.' She pushed the heavy hair back from his forehead. "'Is she your mother?' the lady asked. "'No!' cried the boy, almost fiercely, and then added sullenly, "'I ain't got none.' Slowly the gloved hand passed back and forth over the yellow hair. The lady's eyes were looking far away. The boy's face was like, so strangely like another face. "'Are you hungry?' she asked suddenly. The wide-open grey eyes would have answered her without the quick sob and low, "'Yes!' The carriage stopped, and the monument, again accomplishing a descent, opened the door and stood staring in blank amazement. "'I am not going in, John,' said his mistress. "'Drive home again,' and she added, smiling. "'This little boy crept in out of the cold while the carriage was waiting. I am going to take him home. Drive back as quickly as possible.' 
As the bewildered coachman shut the door and returned to his perch, the boy made a spring forward. Let me out! he cried. I don't want to go home. Let me out! Not your home, said the lady gently. My home. Tom stared at her in wonder, and, too much overcome by the announcement to resist, let her lift him up on the seat beside her. My home, she repeated, where you can get very warm and have a good dinner and a long, long sleep on a soft bed. Will you like that? Tom drew a long, slow breath, but did not answer. It was too wonderful. He, one of Sal's boys, to go to the lady's house where the children lived whom he had seen go in that evening? He looked up suddenly. Were those children yours? he asked. With a sudden movement she drew him very closely to her, and then answered softly. No, not mine. I had a little boy once, like you, and he died. When the carriage stopped again, Tom was fast asleep, so fast asleep that the still bewildered coachman carried him into the house and laid him on a bed without waking him. The next morning, when the boy's eyes opened, he lay looking about him, hardly daring to speak or move. I don't believe he had ever heard anything about fairies, or he would certainly have thought himself in fairyland. Best of all, the lady of the night before was standing by the bed smiling at him, and, smiling back, he held out his arms to her. I wish you could have seen him a little later, when, arrayed in jacket and trousers, that made him think with disdain of certain articles of the same description which he had but yesterday gazed at lovingly as they dangled before old Isaac's dingy second-hand shop. He sat before a little table by the sunny window, taking a short, a very short, preliminary view of a gigantic beefsteak, still indignantly sputtering to itself, a mountain of smoking potatoes, an imposing array of snowy rolls and golden butter, and a pitcher of creamy milk. And I wish, too, you could have seen the same table still later, for the table was about all that was left. That was the first time that I ever saw Tom. Since then I have seen him very often, and now I will tell you, only I am afraid you will hardly believe me, about the last time, and that was not very long ago. I was riding along one of the prettiest country roads you ever saw, and when I came to a certain gate my horse, without waiting for a sign from me, turned in. As we drew nearer the house I caught sight of two figures standing among the flowers. One was a handsome old lady with white hair, the other a young man. She was armed with an immense pair of shears, and he held in his hand his hat filled to the brim with flowers. The sunlight creeping down through the trees, fell upon his close-cropped hair and yellow beard. As I drew in my horse and sat watching them, it all seemed to me like a fairy story. But it wasn't, for the tall, handsome man looking down with such protecting tenderness upon the white-haired old lady was really Tom. Poor, little, thin, cold, hungry, Tom.